few more people coming in online, so I'm just going to go over some housekeeping um, before we get started. So my name is Monet Booker, my pronouns are she, they, uh, and today I am wearing uh, blue jeans and a proud top that is in the bisexual flag colors. Um, all of our guests today are going to be introducing ourselves in that way, that so if anybody has any vision issues online, you kind of have an idea of who's who. Uh, housekeeping for people in the room, in the event, unlike the event of a fire, please exit the building to your right, go through the doors and out onto the spine and run for the hell smell. No, okay. um, if you need the toilet while we're in the, um, in the session, out through the doors to your left and then take another right and your toilets will be there. For those of you online, you will notice that your cameras and mics are muted. That will be the same uh, throughout the entire event. The chat is also muted. If you would like to ask a question today, please go to the Q&A little icon up at the top of the screen and put in your question. You can upvote and downvote questions if you would like one to be particularly answered. However, we've had quite a few pre-submitted questions. We will start each section that we have on this with those pre-submitted questions. Today's themes are trans and non-binary support, LGBTQ and disabilities, and LGBTQ research. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our co-moderators, Anne-Marie Houghton and Brian Webster Henderson. Thank you very much indeed, Monet, and uh, welcome to everybody online and there in the room as well. Um, this is the third of our LGBTQ and A sessions, and it's my pleasure to be able to be moderating again. But I'm even more excited today because I'm being joined by Brian from the University of Cumbria. Um, so who am I? My name is Anne-Marie Houghton. Um, in terms of appearance, my pronouns, I should say, are she, her. In terms of appearance, I've got grey hair, I'm wearing glasses, I'm sporting my grown-up uh, rainbow jacket, um, but also my proud ally t-shirt, um, which is part of our university commitment to raising that awareness. I'm going to now invite, oh, I should also say, which is relevant for today's event, I happen to be a wheelchair user. So it's good that sometimes I have to get these things. Um, but uh, I'm going to in introduce our moderator, <coughs> other moderator, Brian, and then invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves. But Brian, do you want to perhaps just say a word or two? Thanks, Henry. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Webster Henderson. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm a gay man in a relationship for 28 years, and I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Cumbria. Today I'm wearing a blue shirt, a lovely flowery tie, even if I do say so myself, uh, and a checked jacket. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you. Um, I should also probably have said that I have several roles at the university, and one of them, which is why I think I'm here today, is the fact that I have to be the University Dean for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, which is why I get to do these exciting things. I'm going to start with Lancaster colleagues, and um, if I could invite Freya to introduce herself. So, hello, I'm Freya, um, they, them, <laughs> that's okay. Um, I was a graduate, well, I was a student at Lancaster, I graduated in 2021 and went into a job in the physics department with science communication. I'm now in the biomedical and life sciences department um, doing student admin and support. Um, so I'm here to kind of share my lived experience rather than my professional experience, I guess. Um, and because I do identify as disabled, I'm hoping that I can have a bit of an input on those kinds of questions as well. Thank you, Freya. I'm to Josh. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Josh. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm wearing, I'm wearing a very uh, bold purple coloured t-shirt, uh, subjectively a nice t-shirt. Uh, it says Lancaster University Students Union. Um, in terms of my role here in the university, um, I'm the Vice President of Welfare for the union. Um, I'm the sort of liberation lead for the student movement here. Um, and I'm also a governor of the university. Uh, my political roots are very much within um, the sort of queer movement, um, and that's where I sort of come from. It's something that's very close to my heart. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Josh. And Ben. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> my name is Ben Dalton. I'm a lecturer in French studies in the Department of Languages and Cultures, uh, pronouns he, they. I am wearing uh, jeans, um, a uh, jumper with kind of like diamond shapes on it. I've got a shaved head, a bit of a beard. Um, I think that I think that's uh, what I look like. Um, I'm gay, um, so you know I'm kind of uh, interested in uh, you know queer activism and LGBTQIA plus um, 
the LGBTQIA plus world, shall we say, from a personal perspective. Um, but uh, in terms of my research, um, I look at uh, contemporary French philosophy, mainly contemporary French philosophies of uh, gender, sexuality, queerness, and I've got a particular interest in uh, queer healthcare. So I lead the Queer Medical Humanities Network at Lancaster, and I'm interested in the question of the hospital and how hospitals can be more welcoming or open uh, to queer people. Thank you. We look forward to hearing some more about that later then. So I'm now going to hand over to our colleagues at the University of Cumbria and our visitors, uh, Ali. Hello, I'm Ali. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Cumbria. Um, I am a she, her. I have bright red hair, dyed, and uh, I'm wearing a grey jumper uh, with a green top underneath and my pride in nursing badge because I am a proud nurse. I'm an ally and my background comes from working with people with HIV and AIDS in the early 90s um, through to uh, a lot of care recently with people with dementia. Thank you, Ali. And Tommy? Uh, hello, my name is Tommy. Uh, I work for UHMBT, which is the hospital. Um, I am bald, bearded, and wearing a jumper. Um, Mine's gone blank. Uh, I'm queer, uh, part of the LGBTQ plus network at the hospital, and I'm a finance ambassador for EDI. Uh, yeah, and I'm here to to kind of bring from a hospital establishment kind of point of view. That's really helpful. Thank you for that, Tommy. And and it's good that we've actually got that collaboration and connection with universities and also our health service as well. And last but not least, Angie. Hi there, I'm Angie. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, I identify as trans non-binary. Uh, I'm here to represent the Pears Cumbria School of Medicine, which is an exciting new school in partnership between Imperial College London and the University of Cumbria, opening in 2025. Uh, in terms of my uh, appearance, I have long hair, which is tied back. I wear glasses and I'm dressed in a classic all black outfit. Oh, <laughs> Sporting a rainbow young one. Indeed, yes. <laughs> right, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, so we're going to make a start and I'm going to hand over um, to Brian. Uh, we've got a number, as Monet said, a number of questions have been sent before our event. So we will be working through some of those, but we'll also be seeing what questions and calls are being raised on our chat. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And we're going to start off with some questions around trans and non-binary support. And I have to say, we had quite a lot of pre-questions sent in, um, all very quite disparate in the theme. So there's quite a lot of areas to get through. And so I'm going to start off with a, a singular question first that came in, which was around how can I support my trans friend who is having bad mental health because of gender dysphoria? And I wonder if I could just, uh, Josh, I wonder if I could come to you first and just see what your response would be to that question. This is um, sort of quite a current issue here in Lancaster. We've had a lot of students who have reached out to us to try and understand how they can support other students better. Uh, one thing that we really believe in as a union is that students supporting students is far more important than that coming um, necessarily from the university. Especially when it comes to stuff like this, a lot of people struggle to disclose their issues to the university or to other professional services. Um, I think, you know, we very much need to look at as a university and as a society as a whole, what support we're giving people when it comes to sort of gender dysphoria. A lot of people struggle to go to their doctors. Um, I know here in Lancaster, we have um, sort of a disparity between the quality of healthcare trans people get between different practices. Um, here in Lancaster, my advice would always be to sort of reach out to our advice service. Um, we're able to sort of support students and supporting other people. Uh, it's something the Cats Mental Health Service do as well. Um, we do have a support network, a student support network, um, called the LGBT Plus Forum. Um, they, they do a lot of phenomenal work in terms of activism, but also they do a lot of community-based work. And um, actually that community there is really strong. Um, a lot of people go there not knowing anyone, sort of struggling with certain issues, and they'll go along and they make community of people who might tend to be struggling with the same issues they are. Um, and, you know, a lot of people find a real sense of belonging community there. My advice would always be to go along to one of their coffee more, uh, coffee evening events on a Monday or reach out to them on Instagram as well. Josh, it's really great to hear you, as part of the Students' Union, say the value of students supporting other students. And I think that's quite a strong point to hear. Frey, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. Yeah, I, being a student. yeah, so I, I really agree with what you said about um, 
the LGBTQ plus forum and the coffee mornings. When I was a student, my co the coffee mornings from that forum were just like I lived for a Monday <laughs> for a Monday evening to go to the coffee evenings and um, just be with other people who are like me because I came from a background where there weren't any at all. Um, so yeah, being able to have that safe space with other trans and non-binary people or just other queer people in general is lovely. Um, and it helped me kind of work out who I was and feel that I wasn't alone and get support from the other people there. And I mean, I've got friendships going to this day that I made there and we can all support each other through our kind of the struggles that we have, I guess, um, and the bad mental health days. And I think just having a safe space is so important, whether that is a group or whether that's, you know, your friend knows that they can come to you and be safe mm -hmm. and you will just include them in like things. Yeah, like my example is, you know, if you've got friends who are trans women, invite them to girls night with all your other cis women friends. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you know, it's, you can step out into the world and feel like you're treated very differently, um, especially in the healthcare system in Lancaster, because I've got experience of that too. Um, so it's easy to sort of look out and be like, oh God, this is overwhelming and this is quite difficult. But even just one person treating you just like a person, regardless of your identity, is a really, really good way to support your friends. So real encouragement there for us as individuals to really be inclusive to our fellow students who might be struggling or having a bad mental health day. And Josh, I feel really challenged by your answer, if you don't mind me saying, but in a supportive way, because what you talked about there was encouraging people to go to student services. Mm -hmm. As a deputy vice chancellor, I manage student services, and I am sitting here challenging myself to think, what training have we done with our staff around trans and non-binary issues mm -hmm. to help them be relevant and inclusive to students. So I, I, as a guarantee, I'm going to take that away and start to look at that with my team back at my university. Yeah, um, just to come in, I really agree with what you were both saying about the importance of community and, and safe spaces. Um, just to add to that, so um, as a, a lecturer, I do a, a module on uh, LGBTQIA plus writing, film, theory, and kind of one of the, the themes that emerges from that is kind of how um, you know, queer writing, queer film can also figure a kind of community uh, as well, and how um, queer philosophers have talked about them finding uh, community in, in the writing of others. So there's a trans philosopher called Paul B. Preciado that I particularly uh, love, and he talks about growing up and, and reading, you know, the work of you know Judith Butler and Susan Stryker and 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 finding community in. Um, in, in all of that writing. Uh, me, kind of when I was, personally, when I was kind of coming out and, and, and finding my own queerness, I guess I also found um, that really empowering, uh, you know, reading queer literature, watching queer film, reading queer uh, theory as well. I know it, it, you, you hear the word theory and you think it's going to be so abstract, etc. But, you know, I read these things as a kind of how to how to be gay or how to be queer, etc. And you know, I think that's where my my love of it came from because I could, you know, these were books that talked about what it was like to be in that body in that in the world and and you know how to live your sexuality and your desire. So I think that's a way of community as well. Thank you, Ben. And Marie. Well, yes, I suppose just picking up on what you were saying, Brian, about you know what our services offer. I suppose one of the things that I would say, and also the question. So LGBT and having some mental health issues, of course, that links the two, one of the two things that we've got today. So I think sometimes there'll be situations where students, they may be finding support from people who, um, from a group linked to their mental health. We have training at the university for students and staff to be able to look after your mate in terms of support from the National Student Minds Initiative. But I think also we have an inclusive learning network, uh, which I'm proud to be able to um, help and facilitate. And we have both professional services and also um, academic staff and things who will come along <coughs> to, to hear about a wide range of issues, including mm. these particular things and support for students. So perhaps afterwards we can talk about whether there's a way of collaborating be there. Would be there. Angie, I wonder if you can bring you in, because you identified at the beginning as trans non-binary. What would your response be to that original question? Yeah, absolutely. So I think 
particular you know within the community there are many mental health challenges um you know i've been through my fair share certainly um and i think from the communities that i'm in um everyone's got their own need within that so you know what people find helps nurture and supports their own mental health is is individual to themselves um so I, th I think community has been raised i think that's a really valuable point um but you know i'm part of many loving communities but i'm not always i don't always feel seen or you know or, or you know valued within that as as myself you know people will come with perceptions of who i am um, so for me, the mechanisms that I use within, you know, people that I'm supporting, it's about those small conversations that are about, you know, those really daily pivotal things. You know, what what are the words of affirmation that you, you know, find valuable that will make you feel safe and feel seen uh, and braver within these spaces? Um, I think within, you know, teaching spaces particularly, um, Ali, you were talking about earlier today about the essential nature of having a reading list, uh, you know, which covers... Queer, queer literature, but also brings queer positionality within to that space and that context of that subject as well. And then also, you know, thinking, thinking also about, you know, we celebrate, we have lots of celebratory months, you know, this is LGBTQ History Month, it's Women's History Month next month, we have uh, Black History Month, etc. But being conscious uh, as institutions, being conscious about celebrating them constantly, not just at one period of the year um, and again you know nurturing therefore that kind of aspect of being seen being valued uh, for students particularly um, so yeah I think I think you know coming back to that individual approach for each uh, student and each friend uh, is really valuable. Thank you Angie. I'm going to just try and move this on to a different question if that's all right um, and we've got a lot to get through so I'll just probably just use this as a final question for this section but there were some questions that came in uh, around sex, bodies and access to healthcare services and some of the challenges there. So in a combined way, some of the questions focused on what is the preferred terminology for non-binary people when they are disclosing sex data? And how could I respectfully discuss their bodies in relation to the treatment and care when providing physical health care? So let's break that down and let's look at that issue around preferred terminology for non-binary people when disclosing sex data. Tommy, is that something you'd like to perhaps? I mean, I can, stab at? I can talk about the uh, the importance of uh, accurate recording medical history. We've um, I've heard some unpleasant stories about trans people who have not been capitalized properly because the accuracy of the medical histories not been recorded properly. I've heard stories about how people have turned up to appointments who we shouldn't have been invited to in those appointments because our electronical records haven't been, again, recorded accurately. It's not something that we, we do great, um, but we are looking into improving it and working with the LGBTQ plus networks, uh, which I'm a member of, um, about fixing this going forward because our systems, our electronic patient records, EPRs, uh, are not fit for purpose in my current state, but we're meant to be getting a new one next year. I'm very excited by the prospect of improving things for it, but yeah, I can talk, yeah, the importance of that accurate medical history for our trans and non-binary patients. And um, yeah, another thing is we keep getting asked the same questions over mm. and over again, and that must be so infuriating for them as from a patient experience point of view. And I could probably think of countless press stories, uh, particularly I'm a nurse by background, so particularly in the nursing press, where these issues have been raised by individuals accessing health services and feel let down by the health service because of that lack of awareness and identity. Ali, you told us at the beginning you were a nurse. What would your response be to that question? So I've kind of fought for this for many years. Um, I was part of a Royal College of Nursing group that looked at fair care for trans people in 2006. And we did a whole e-learning package and a whole package that went along that and it kind of disappeared. And it can be very frustrating for me as a non-trans person. I'm now teaching students radiographers. And one of the things that they have to ask everyone in a radiography setting is last menstrual period because of the issue of irradiating potentially a fetus. 
So they struggle with this all the time. And there's a fantastic TED talk that I show them from a trans uh, man who talks about um, being asked this question and just saying, just ask. Don't pussyfoot around the place and be all kind of like, oh, God, I don't know what to say. Just ask and be polite. And I think a lot of this comes down to our intention. Mm. So what's our intention when we ask a question or we make a mistake or we use the wrong language or we do something? If our intention is good and we immediately apologise and say, I'm so sorry, didn't mean to step on your toes, not, not, then I think that's OK. There's a whole load of questions that came up in 2006, 2007 around bathrooms. They always do. Don't know why. Um, you know, why we're so obsessed with where we go to the loo. Who knows? But apparently it's a thing. Um, and I think people wrestle with these ideas. And, and for many people, it's something where they actually haven't talked about it. And I think that's part of it, having that conversation. So I've had students where I've talked about housing for people who are trans and gay in later life um, and, and what that would look like. Both my gay children have said there's no way they want to be anywhere near heterosexuals when they're older, thank you very much. So I've gone, OK. Um, <clears throat> but I think I think we have to be very clear about this. And, and I had students who said it's not an issue. And one of the students who worked in residential care told an absolutely horrendous story of somebody who liked to wear dresses and died on their own in a room with care workers not supporting them particularly because they were frightened and also other residents not speaking to them and told the group this who said, oh, we all give non-judgmental care. I think we need to be able to have honest conversations in healthcare. We need to be able to own the spaces we live in and actually say I do have an issue with that and that's okay but how do we get you over that issue that's my thing and I think not allowing ourselves to have that issue and, and clamping down on conversations is completely the wrong thing to do I think. And Ali the second part of that question was around respectful mm. respectfulness in discussion with trans people who might be accessing, accessing healthcare mm. in whatever form, whether that's as an inpatient, an outpatient, a GP or a one-to-one -one session. The question was about how could I respectfully discuss their bodies in relation to their treatment when providing physical care? And I guess there's some key messages that you've echoed there about just being transparent, yep. being asking, being open. Is there anything I should add to we, that? We all have issues. So I have issues sometimes. I've, I've had an issue once with a patient who had a full body tattoo. And I was A, weirded out by it. I was a young student nurse. And I was kind of slightly weirded out by the whole body moving when I was trying to talk to them. So I had to just approach it and be quite honest and say, I've never seen one of these before. You know, I'm an 18 year old girl. I, I haven't. And, and it's really interesting, why did you get it done? And talk to them and have conversations. And it is, Brian, going back to that thing of your intention. Is your intention coming from a place of goodness? I totally echo what you say about being asked questions over and over again, but I don't think that that's necessarily something which is just for LGBTQ plus people. But, you know, my dad used to say, he was sick and tired of, why do they keep asking? They've got a pile of notes in front of them. Do they not know who I am? So I don't think it's, I think it's a healthcare issue, to be honest with you, Brian. And I think that respect is very much, has been wrapped up in many ways, certainly in the nursing world, in words like dignity, which I don't think are very helpful. Um, I would say respect is a much better word to use. Respecting where someone's coming from, but also them respecting where you're coming from and your interest isn't something weird and wonderful, like you're a kind of thing under a microscope. As a human to a human, why am I asking you this? And will it benefit your care if you give me an honest answer and I try and be honest with you? And that's where I've come from with that. And when I'm teaching, that's what I say. Thank you, Ali. I'm going to slip in one last question before we move to the next session. And um, I'm just going to kind of ask different views. I'm going to start on this side of the table, actually. This, I thought this was a really interesting question when you stop and think about it. And the question was simply, how will the university support my non-binary child in student accommodation? So mm. I wonder if we could just translate that question into how do you think or what do you think the university should do to support non-binary students in accommodation? 
Josh, can I start with you? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah I can answer this as sort of governor of the university <clears throat> and sort of what I know we sort of expect in terms of minimum surf- service level in terms of sport. Um, so when it comes to accommodation, um, people can submit sort of what preferences they have in terms of accommodation. For example, if this sort of non-binary person was uncomfortable being in a sort of a, an all boys flat or, you know, sort of a gendered flat, then absolutely they will not be put into that and the university would put them into, a you know, an accommodation that's appropriate for them. Um, in terms of the more holistic support that, you know, is at the university, all the well-being support that we have in terms of Central University um, is, you know, equal access to all students. Um, and the sort of college level support that we have is very much focused in person on campus as well. So when students come to university, um, they will get introduced to the college advisory teams that we have here who focus on the sort of well-being and mental health support and sort of initial instance who uh, those students will be able to go to. In terms of more student support, we've got JCRs. And um, so the JCR stands for junior common room, very old term, um, who are sort of a group of students per college who will basically help induct these students into university life um, in collaboration with the student union and the sort of colleges as well. Uh, and we try and introduce students to the first port of call, what their support is, where they can go. And we try and explain that as soon as they move in day one. Um, so it's very clear what support they can receive as well. Um, and we do try and make sure that, you know, emails are sent out before they come to university so they're aware of what is available. And we do try and advertise, again, coming back to community stuff, we do try and advertise that LGBT plus forum a first instance to all the students as well. And Josh, I'm going to assume a question like this may have come from a parent because they're talking about their child. Is there anything you think universities should be doing for parents of non-binary individuals? How, what, how would you? Right, I think, you know, it's important to recognise that when people come to university, they're an adult, but I think, you know, there's a lot more interaction that we can do with parents, especially those who are worried with um, their kids going to universities. A lot of time, queer people, when they come to university, they're le- leaving a support network they've had for so long. Mm. And it can be isolating for any student, but particularly of trans and non-binary students. I think potentially we, we can do a lot more in terms of working with the parents, sort of communicating to them what the support systems are at the university. Um, so they can, you know, en- encourage the child to sort of reach out to those support networks at the university as well. Um, I think, you know, on open days, we do try and make sure that we're as visible as possible. Um, particularly as a student union. So, you know, we make the parents aware that, you know, trans and non-binary people are welcome here in Lancaster and support as well. Great, thank you, Josh. Well, I was sort of going to sort of in a sense add to something of what Josh was saying, because I think (coughs) things like open days are important, but I think actually the other thing is on open days and on the website, um, there's a lot of other signs and signals about the way in which the university is supported. Mm. They're really picking up on your point, Ali, because one of our key values at the university is respect. So I think it's how we signal that. Now, interestingly, we've just launched at the university an informal anti-harassment and bullying team, which is an informal process, which is apart from our formal processes for students and all staff. And I mention that not because, in a sense, what is the university doing? But it's because that puts informal support is there. Mm. And sometimes people, they've met somebody, they haven't fully understood what's going on, they, they're they not sure if they're being bullied or harassed. And this is a network where people can be supported in that particular way. But obviously we've been saying a little bit about what Lancaster does. And, I, and I'm just wondering, I don't know if it's Angie or yourself, Brian, you might want to say perhaps what the University of Cumbria does. Cumbria's got a very similar approach Mm. in terms of accommodation. I think one of the things um, that we would probably find is that 43% of our students are never on accommodation. They're off-campus students, uh, whether they're doing degree apprenticeships or whether they're CPD students. So of the 14,500, 43% never touch one of the five campuses. So we have to focus a lot of time and attention on communication through other means rather than face to face. And it's about getting that balance right of where you make sure there's consistency in information to students, irrespective of their mode of study. And that's been a real challenge for us. Mm. Is there anything else anyone wants to add to that question? Great. In that case, I'm going to hand over to Anne-Marie, who's going to 
take us through LGBTQ plus and disabilities questions. Indeed. Thank you, Brian. Um, and, and obviously, depending upon how we get on, we may have a chance to be able to return to some of the other questions that we, we didn't get a chance to go through um, already. So um, I think in terms of the first question of where can I find peers and community in the Northwest as someone who is neurodivergent <coughs> and LGBT? And I suppose in a sense, this is both a question for somebody who might be a student or a member of staff, um, so it obviously doesn't, it doesn't specify, um, but who is actually having those two particular characteristics. I don't know if there's anybody who would particularly wish to um, start on that. that. Angie, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and usually I think for the panel, I'm not someone that lives in this region. I, I, I come up from London uh, as part of the partnership. Um, but I, I am from Cumbria. I was born in White, uh, Whitehaven and have a number of family and friends in the area. So I'm very aware that there are, um, over the certainly over the past year since COVID, there have been a number of queer walking groups that have established themselves, but they've kind of, you know, diversified. They do they do queer craft, they do, you know, queer book club, etc. So I, I'll make sure that I uh, look up the names and, and hand them over to Monet so that it can be circulated. But I think off the top of my head, it's um, Lakes Queer Cumbria. Um, and uh, that's, at, I know for a fact, is led by neurodivergent people as well. That's really useful about specific networks of, of, of actually people coming together. It's also interesting what you say about the um, COVID um, situation. Mm. I think one of the things that we did at the university was to launch our LGBTQIA plus allies network, because in a sense, during that COVID time, how was one in a position <coughs> to signal some of these things? Now, with neurodivergence, obviously that's, that's a hidden disability, unlike my own, which is the wheelchair. Um, but Josh, from a sort of student union perspective, would there be anything particular? Yeah, so we, um, again, so as we talk about community before, I mentioned the LGBT plus uh, liberation forum we have here in Lancaster. We also have a students with disabilities liberation forum as well. Um, and we do sort of recognise that, you know, identity is intersectional. So those forums don't work in isolation. They work with each other and we sort of support them as a union as well. Um, and I know particularly there's a lot of sort of intersection between the students with disabilities forum and the LGBT plus um, forum as well. So a lot of the stuff is you know, done in collaboration, done between people who are sort of of the same community as well. And um, so I'd very much encourage people to reach out to them if they're coming to Lancaster and the student as well. I'm going to move to Ali, but I might come back to you for a staff perspective as well in a moment, Ben. So I'm coming from a staff perspective okay, as well, so there you go. Um, but, but I was going to say, as a, a programme leader who leads a very, very diverse uh, group of students from across the country with a lot of neurodivergent students, I think um, we have an excellent study skills support system at Cumbria and the team there are superb. Um, we also, I think there is more work to be done, I would not say, and I, I don't want to stand here, so, or sit here actually, I am, sit here saying that we've, we've nailed it because I don't think we have. Uh, I think there is more work to be done in this area and, and as a person in charge of many students' futures, um, I know that with some of my neurodivergent um, students, it's been hard to pick up and it isn't until they come to university often that this is picked up. So I think there's some work there to do around before university and some kind of pre-screening, which would be really helpful. I also think that there's work to do around, they all have individual action plans. So from a teacher's point of view, I know what they need. But um, with one or two of them who are who have more than one um, aspect of neurodivergence, uh, they've required individual tailored plans with us as a tutorial team. Now, I think and, and we've worked with the um, disability team to actually help us with that. Um, so I think <coughs> there are lots of things we can do. I'm not sure it's coordinated enough at the moment. And I think in terms of also adding in the LGBTQ element to things sometimes one of them out lives out does the other in a funny sort of way so one element of it becomes more important to that person at the time because they're studying than the other and it's about bringing them together and how we connect the two so that they are both seen as a positive aspect of that person's life 
rather than something impinging on their study and their ability to be a community. I totally pick up on what Brian said earlier, all my students are online. So I'm very in, um, passionate about building an online community for them. And that will take a number of forms. But I think, you know, there is room for us to do more. There's room for us to grow and there's room for us to take these kind of things on board, which is great to come here and hear about as well. That's really there's some lots of buttons there for a point of agreement. But, uh, ben, anything you'd want to say? Yeah, well, um, I, I really agree. And I, I don't know how much I have to add other than I'd love to go to that walking group. That sounds absolutely <laughs> fantastic. I'll, I'll get that um, uh, after. Um, I guess also from a, a staff perspective as a lecturer, I'm really interested in assessment and diversifying assessment. I think when we're talking about neurodiversity, um, diversity of assessment is, is really, really important so to make sure that we're not just kind of having one kind of uh, form of assessment. You know, someone might uh, really not want to do presentations, for example, or, or speak in front of other people, but might really want to do writing and, and vice versa. Um, so that's something I'm really interested in at the moment is innovating assessment, diversifying it, making it more flexible and uh, realising that, I don't know, it's, it's like you were saying that it's, you know, neurodiversity or, or, or being LGBT, not something that impinges on your study and not being seen like that, but obviously being seen as a, a real strength and, and kind of exploring ways in which you, you do want to express the, the work that you've been doing at university, um, you know, to the best of your, uh, in, in the way that you want to express it. So, yeah, I guess, um, assessment um, is what I wanted to talk about um, and then also that that walking group which I'll get the details of after. Yes and um, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad you've been there is that all right? Thank in. you very much and um, so and we'll talk about sort of um, you know disability support within academics and um, I think you know here in Lancaster it's very much something we're looking at now we're talking about we do have something called integrated learning plans um, integrated learning support plans, ILSPs, um, which are designed to be able to support departments and the student in making reasonable adjustments for the students to be able to continue their learning to make it as accessible as possible. I think there's a lot more that we need to do as a sector and as a university as well in making those easier to attain. A lot of times you need medical records, you need evidence, but many students coming to university, it's their first time exploring their neurodiversity and they haven't necessarily got the you know, diagnosis or the correct medical records and therefore they struggle to get the ILSP and get the proper adjustments they need. Um, and that's very much something we need to look at as a sector. I think something that like, you know, the National Health Service um, in terms of um, waiting times to get diagnoses, um, a lot of people really struggle with that. I think as a university as well, it's worth noting that we're going through something called the Curriculum Transformation Project. So we're looking at the curriculum and, you know, making it more accessible by design, because if we're having to get a load of ILSPs, which are sort of making a certain adjustment, why not just adjust the curriculum? Uh, it's something that we're looking at here in Lancaster and we're hoping sort of inspires the rest of the sector as well. And I'm hoping in the next sort of um, five to seven years that that will, you know, completely revolutionise how neurodivergent and disabled people interact with academia as well. Well, I'm really pleased that you've almost taken some of what I was going to say, <laughs> so not at all, in the sense of the curriculum transformation programme, because picking up on what Ben said, there's a particular strand which is about looking at inclusive and authentic assessment. <coughs> and that's one area. Yes, curriculum transformation is something that we're thinking about, but I think in terms of the actual inclusive learning support plans, not the integrated, but actually we are moving to a point of integration um, because one of the things that we've been doing with those plans, instead of them just focusing on disabled students, actually we're thinking that there are a number of ways in which students might need support. So we've recently encompassed all the issues to do with maternity um, so that actually we have one inclusive learning support plan and that will cover that. And we're in the process at the moment of then looking at which of issues in which we can actually integrate the trans support that might happen for somebody who's going through transition, which again would be within the same support arrangement. I think the other point in terms of uh, linking through in that particular connection, as Josh said, this is a sector wide issue. So the, Dis the Disabled Student Commission has identified a number of actions which all universities are being asked to work through in terms of the charter and also particularly connect there. 
I'm going, just to, I don't know if Brian wants anything to add at this point, but I'm mindful that this question did relate to any peers in community. So if there's anybody online who's got ideas, you can't, but you could put it in the Q&A and Monet will collect it. So if you've got any ideas for where people could meet in the Northwest and you'd be willing to share those with us, type your point in the Q&A and Monet will be able to collect those for us to be able to share afterwards. But Freya, I know a quick point before we need to move on. I, I had to jump in on the ILSP conversation. I know it's a tangent from the original question, but I think it's a really important point that we are now having ILSPs coming through from students who are parents, carers who are pregnant, etc. Um, and as part of my role in the teaching office in, in BLS, we get all of the ILSPs through. We have so many um, and you know everyone has different needs and it's I started in August and one of my first things was I wanted to have a proper process for actually reading the ILSPs and making sure they were all you know adhered to and people had risk assessments for the labs when they needed them and stuff and I think it's great that we're having more and more varied ones but um, I think at some point along that the departments are all going to have to individually figure out how they process all of them without them falling through the cracks um, and I think that will be an interesting task <laughs> for departments. Absolutely and I'm just going to pick up BLS um, a bit like ILSP and ABC and JFF or whatever. Um, BLS is biological life sciences. Biomedical um, life sciences. Bio bio biomedical bio life, medical life sciences. There we are you see. I've learned something as well. Thank you Bray. Um, we've got one other question in relation to LGBTQ plus disability, which I'm going to sort of try and squeeze in and then hand over to Brian for research related questions. What assumptions does the panel feel like people make on an LGBT people with disabilities and how can we challenge them? Now, this person talks about having a gay friend who uses a walking frame and he really struggles to find a partner because people, because people assume he is asexual. And I think one of the things I was saying before um, we started, went on live, is that I think sometimes people who are, have a very visible disability are often assumed to be asexual. Um, and that is a challenge, mm. I can say, from a personal perspective. Um, but would any of our panel perhaps feel that they could offer a thought in relation to that? Yeah, I mean, thank you. I can, I can try and have some thoughts. They're not very constructed in my head, but I'll have a go. So um, I think there's two separate issues that come together on that one is like like you sort of mentioned the there's perceptions around disabled people in general, never mind queer disabled people, but disabled people in general um, and assumptions people make on their sexuality, their relationships, etc. So, you know, sometimes if you've got somebody with a very visible disability, people will look at them and their partner and assume they sort of have a caring relationship and that disabled person is a burden and their partner is a carer and that's not true at all and I would imagine you know those sort of assumptions would would hold regardless of you know sexuality um, or you know say say people with developmental disabilities like Down syndrome or autism etc um, again being assumed that sort of infantilized there's an issue with that and that will come along with you know assuming you're asexual I mean when I'm when I told my family I had a partner for the first time they were not surprised that I was gay they were just like oh I assumed you, you weren't interested in anybody so yes I'm autistic but that doesn't mean I'm asexual and <laughs> um, so yeah there's a lot of perceptions like I was saying to you earlier depending on the disability how visible it is what sort of disability it is there's so many stereotypes that come with that and there's stereotypes that come of um, queer people's sexuality anyway, you know, we all know like, the stereotypes of gay men being really promiscuous. And it's like, so having those two stereotypes coming together as a disabled gay person, I imagine is difficult and a bit annoying, but I don't know what, I, I don't know what the solution would be. Um, yeah, I don't know what the solution would be. Yes, I mean, I suppose in a, in a sense, one of the things, and I'm, I'm mindful, sadly, that we do need to move on to our next topic, but I suppose one of the things is that actually opening up some of these things in conversation, actually being supportive. So the fact that somebody's taken the time to share this question as a 
as a friend of somebody um, to see what they can do. That in itself is a positive action that that person has made. And if any of us can actually think to do some of that with others as well, that seems to me to be very important. I'll, I'll share my experience, Andrew, on that. So I, I am a gay man and I'm severely dyslexic. Um, so it's a, a kind of a hidden uh, disability. Um, and I'm terrible at spelling if I try and write. My safety is my computer. I have to, <laughs> I have to work with that as much as, as possible. But I do sometimes get things terribly wrong, even my name. Uh, and I did send an email once and I signed it Brina instead of Brian. <clears throat> it created a lot of humour. Um, oh, hello, Brini, how are you? And, you know, people would be stopping, going, all right, Brini. And I thought, oh, what, what's going on, what's going on? And when I discovered what it was, I felt really upset. Mm. I felt really, I know people didn't mean to be slanderous, but it felt personal. Yeah. And I made a very conscious decision at that stage that as a deputy vice chancellor, a senior visible leader in a university, I would take every opportunity I could to tell people that I was gay, to tell people that I was dyslexic, and try and demystify some of the notions about it and try and create a bit of normality for me, quite selfish perhaps. But I thought it was really, really important. Um, I did have an experience once at a university I worked at, but I didn't get promotion because I was told we don't need your type here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've worked in six universities, so I won't say which one that was. And that was quite a battle to go over that. And it's those types of experiences as an individual that hurt and are really difficult. And so I think we all have the responsibility to be role models, to call things out and to try and make things as normal as possible. And I say that in inverted commas because my normal might not be the same as yours, but I don't care who I upset now. I just want to be me and say who I am and that's other people's problems. I'll help them to deal with that and help them to learn from that, but I'm not going to shy away from it. And to be respected, but I think actually, you know, you, you say it's perhaps a bit selfish, Brand, but I would say that actually as leaders, um, but as anybody, the more that we, we, we are in a position where we can speak out and actually help others to feel confident and comfortable in a culture that is inclusive to be able to say who they are. So perhaps a call to all leaders um, to feel that they're able to share something, but again, not to be forced because that would also be potentially traumatic for that person. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Brian, because I know we've got one or two questions on LGBTQ plus and research. Thank you. And thank you to those that are here in attendance or are online who submitted a question about research. I have to say they were, they were quite specific and I don't think I'd be able to answer many of them, if any, because they're not my discipline or expertise, for example. I'll just give you a flavour. People were really keen to know, is there any research on X, Y, Z, asexual and romantic people? Is there any research on ethnicity, social class, education, and how it impacts on sexual orientation? Why are gender identity clinics have such long waiting lists? What's the research? And I don't think our panel uh, or any of us would be able to answer the specifics, but there is an issue there around research and LGBTQ plus issues. And I wonder if the panel have any ideas around, do we think there's enough research? And what areas do we think there should be research on? And how do we create that as universities whose role is to provide new knowledge, one of the roles, provide new knowledge. Ben, do you have any thoughts mm. maybe from your own discipline or your own experience in response to that? Yeah, well, I guess I can talk from uh, the point of view of kind of working in um, on issues relating to queer healthcare. Um, I think this is a really important area of research. And I've recently founded the Queer Medical Humanities Network at Lancaster to kind of bring together two areas that I think have a lot of overlap but aren't always um, explicitly uh, kind of brought together. So that is questions of um, uh, healthcare and, and medicine and, and what it means to be LGBTQIA plus and going through the culture where trans people aren't welcome. And I think, you know, a lot of our, you know, national services, our healthcare services and, you know, our universities across the country reject that sort of idea. But without that, you know, leadership from, you know, the people we elect on a national level, it's hard for the sector to progress. It's hard for us to move further. It's harder for us to find funding for research, which is doing so much good, so many good things. Um, 
I just thought it was important to highlight that that is a really big barrier to um, LGBT plus research right now. Thank you, Josh. And you, when you uh, uh, introduced yourself as trans non-binary, did you look to research to see what the experiences were? Did you find it? Um, not so much in terms of kind of academic research, but I think, you know, uh, as others have said, you know, throughout my educational journey, I was reading a lot of literature. And in fact, I, I studied arts, I studied textiles design, uh, and I chose the opportunity to use all of my writing, all my uh, dissertations to explore queer theory and explore dress, etc. Um, so it was a really good opportunity in that respect. I think part of what you asked, Brian, was thinking about the institutional role in research, which kind of really kind of jogged my my kind of uh, synapses. So, you know, the institutional part in redefining what research is. Research can be so formulaic in terms of you have this many people you talk to, these are your outputs, and you you have a paper, and then you might present that paper. But I think there's an opportunity to creatively reconstruct what uh, research is, thinking about. Uh, you know, how we maybe elevate or, or, or create space for more grassroots research um, and, and where the funding goes, you know, which direction is the funding being channeled, for example. Uh, there's a really good community called Shades of Noir. Uh, they specialise in race and practice based social justice. Uh, and I've done a lot of work with them as well. Uh, and my pedagogic practice, my teaching practice is about inclusive practices within the curriculum and, and um, higher education institutions. Uh, and they do a lot of work, particularly around when they publish journals. It's not an academic journal. We invite students, we invite staff, and we invite people from the communities where we want to promote their voices. And we encourage them to submit articles and, um, you know, lived experiences. Um, and with, that's what we use as our case studies as we work with higher, uh, higher education institutions um, to develop action plans. And then that's the other thing. It's about if you're going to do research, where's the accountability or what, where does that research lead to? How can we create action plans? And actually, you know, if you are going to do a research on a topic, you know, how does that then, how can that then contribute to a wider community of practice uh, within the institutions that you're in? And Ali, I think you've done some research uh, in, in the past. Would you like to make any comment about your experiences of research within the LGBT community and dementia, for example. Yeah, so um, I, I have looked quite extensively at uh, LGBTQ plus uh, work with dementia and issues around um, care homes and residential settings. Um, there is a group who are looking at creating residential care for people within the LGBTQ plus community just for them. Um, I've often been worried about students' responses to that because there is an, uh, an element in any kind of healthcare, um, like nursing, for example, code of conduct which says we must be non judgmental. Again, going back to the respectful and open conversations, I think we cloud what we really think underneath or our subconscious uh, biases. Uh, by saying we're non-judgmental and then carrying out care often that isn't non-judgmental. So I think we have to be mindful of how we have those conversations. But I think in terms of research, I am absolutely passionate about research and I'm writing a little helpful book of research at the moment for my students um, because I think it's kind of the basis for where we get our knowledge from. And as you said earlier, Brian, we're about creating more knowledge and therefore, I think it's important that we look at that collaborative space as well. I think more work needs to be done where there's more inclusive, co-partnered, co-productive research where people in communities are involved and take the steer. So dementia is a really good case because one of the Scottish, the Scottish um, people on dementia are the best as far as I'm concerned because I did my master's in Scotland. But basically... Um, they have a saying which is nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And I think it is really important, and that comes from disability work as well, that we are mindful of what people in the community want research to be on. Not as an academic, ooh, that's a very interesting subject, I'll go study it. But actually, what do people in those communities want that research to be about? Then we focus our work on research in that, and then we make the research around the needs of that community, because otherwise I think it's research for research sake, and that's pointless. Thank you. Anne-Marie, I'm going to hand back to you. 
Thank you very much indeed, Brian. Um, and I think for research, one of the things that I also think is important is how we disseminate um, some of that research. And I was delighted just before Christmas to receive a scarf um, from one of my PhD students, or not my PhD, a PhD student I'd been working with. And uh, that was their dis part of their dissemination. They have their thesis, but the scarf is completely covered with all their findings and the discussion of their PhD. And that's a real discussion point every time I wear it, because it opens up opportunities for any particular topic, fantastic form of dissemination. And it's been a fantastic discussion that I think we've had here. Um, I, it's my privilege to be able to say thank you to all our panellists um, for answering the questions. For the many people who've sent us questions beforehand, we are very mindful that we haven't got through all of them, but we do hope that the discussion has been interesting and informative and that you'll be able to sort of share some of the ideas and continue some of these conversations as well. Um, behind any event like this, um, there are all sorts of people that have spent a lot of time. So I'd like to thank those people who've been behind the scenes, checked the technology, sorted out the rooms, arranged the publicity, prepared guides and information for Brian and myself, um, briefed us as panellists. Um, many, many thanks indeed. Um, it's been a pleasure sharing this uh, uh, co-moderating process with Brian um, and vice versa <laughs> so I look forward to this again but um, thank you for listening thank you for our audience and I'm going to hand now to Monet who's going to say something about what next all right thank you so much uh, thank you for those in the room that attended the live event today um, I want to take a moment and thank our moderators Brian Webster Henderson and Anne-Marie Houghton I'll give them a round of applause <laughs>